Good morning, everybody. We want to welcome you to church this morning. If you'll take just a quick second to like, share, comment via whatever platform you're watching from this morning, we want to get the message of Jesus out to everybody that we possibly can. Now, join us as we worship together.
His name is so beautiful. I mean, at the name of Jesus, the Bible says at some point, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, the Bible tells us in the book of Acts that there's no other name given among men whereby we might be saved than that of Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus is so good to us, so wonderful to us for what he's done and what he's doing and what he will do. And you know, I want you to take a minute right now, get, get your sacraments, get your family around, get ready to receive communion. But I want you to stop for a minute just in your own mind. And maybe, maybe after church today, as you're having lunch, you can have this conversation. But I want you to just think about the good things God has done for you. I want you to think about what Jesus has done, the provision he's made for you, the, the breath that you have in your lungs right now, the, the family that God has given you, the safety of your home, the provision of your life. And you know, if you're struggling right now, I want you to know you're not alone. Jesus is with you. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And your church family is with you and we're here to help you. And I just want to encourage you today. Listen, Jesus loves you. Think about what you're thankful for. You know, a lot of times we center our theology around us. You know, in the last few years, that's kind of what's happened. We've kind of made things about us. And we talk about Christianity as if, you know, this works and it, it, God does this. And if you do this and God does, and it works. But it's not about that. It's about following Jesus in the path that he's chosen for us and remembering what he did for us and how he's empowered us to carry his message throughout history. You know, when he said, remember me in this, as he was sitting there talking to his disciples and he said, when you do this, when you do this, when you break bread, when you, when you come together, when the Passover time comes, you need to remember me. He was saying, he was saying, don't remember the old. Don't, don't remember that, that deliverance from Egypt. That's great. It's great that the Israelites were delivered from Egypt and the death angel passed over them because of the blood that was over their doorpost. But I want you to remember me. I want you to remember what I've done and what I'm about to do. He was telling the disciples, you're going to see it. And this is my body and it's going to be broken and I'm going to shed my blood for you. And, and I want you to remember when you sit down together to eat, I want you to remember. Wouldn't it be great that if every time we sit down and ate, every time we sit down and met around um, a dinner meal, that instead of just saying a prayer of thanksgiving for our meal and saying, God bless this food as we so religiously do. What if we said, let's just take a minute and remember what Jesus did. And what did he do? I know he was crucified. I know he was beaten. I know that he rose again from the dead after he was put in that tomb. But what did all that accomplish? Redemption. The Apostle Paul said it this way. He said, he said, I am not my own. I am bought with a price. And you know, we oftentimes say salvation is free because it is. We can't work for it. We can't earn it. We can't buy it. All it takes is for us believing and committing to Jesus Christ. And he will save us and change us from the inside out. It's free to us in that sense. There's a cost in following Jesus, absolutely, but it, salvation, forgiveness, redemption, it's free to us. We just have to choose it. But it wasn't free. It came at a high price. And so when we commit our life to Christ, when we commit to follow him, it's because he paid for our salvation. And that's why Paul said, I'm a bondservant of Christ. A bondservant was one who, who after their time of service was over, they attached themselves to the family that they worked for because they loved them so much. It was like their family. It was a bond of love. And that's what Paul said, I am with Christ. I'm a bondservant of Christ. I'm attaching myself to him. I am not my own. He is Lord of my life. He is owner of my life. And I'm bought with a heavy price, a steep price, the price of his blood. So I want us to remember what, what did he do? Remember what he did. Remember how that changes you. Remember 
You know, sometimes I forget what it was like when I first gave my life to Jesus and how much he delivered me from. And I've grown so much over the years spiritually, and I know that's happening to you as well. I hope it is. But the truth is, we need to sometimes look back and go, wow, God, what you have done. Nobody really knows, but I know. So today, as we receive these communion sacraments, I I want you to remember. I want you to remember, we are bought with a price, and it was a steep one. And I want you to understand something that the reason we were bought with that price, the reason that price was paid was because it could be, and it could only be paid by one. And that was Jesus, the son of God, because his father sent him for God. So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Our God is great. As a matter of fact, he's, there's nothing greater than father God. And so today, just because of the power of the Holy Spirit is resident with us in this worship experience, because Jesus, the Son of God, gave his life for us and went into the tomb and rose again from the dead, and because Father God is directing and guiding and providentially affecting our world and our lives, we need to remember, and we need to worship, and we need to praise him. And he is going to do something miraculous in you and your family. Let's receive today. Father, we thank you so much for the gift of your son. And we remember not just the actions that he did, but what it accomplished. We remember that you saved us, God. Soteria, saved, delivered, set free, prospered, helped. God, that's what you did for us. You you redeemed us. You bought us with a steep price. There is no steeper price. You said greater love than this has no man than he would lay his life down for his friends. Father, we just come to you thankful today for the gift of Jesus and for the breaking of his life for us. In the shedding of his blood, we receive this bread now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Father, now we take this cup. This cup that in the Garden of Gethsemane, you cried out, Lord, if it's your will to remove this cup from me, let it be done. But not my will, your will. The battle that this blood would be shed happened in that garden in agony and I just pray right now Heavenly Father as we receive this blood we'll remember we will remember what this blood has bought we'll not take it for granted we'll not take advantage of it we'll not take you we'll not walk over you we'll not we'll we'll not take your advantage of your grace but like that song says we need it every day and Lord we remember we remember the price that was paid that we didn't have to pay but that you paid we receive it now in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit bless you let's worship
everybody. I'm so glad that you decided to be in church with us today online. Isn't it exciting that we can come together and worship God right in our own homes and be together as a church family? I want to ask you to do something, if you will. Uh, as you're watching online, take a minute if you have to get your phone out or if you have to get on your computer or however you're uh, being a part of this worship experience this morning, I want to encourage you to do something with me. Uh, I want you to make a comment. I want you to say hi to somebody else that you see is watching and worship. I think it's I think it's important for us right now to make connections with each other. So I, I want to encourage you to do that. Say hello, make a greeting, maybe share the worship experience with a neighbor or a friend uh, on your social media. But man, let's really make connections today. And as we're going through this message, I want you to jump in, get on that you version and get your notes out, maybe your Bible, your journal, however you do it. But let's really engage and lean into this this morning. And man, if you agree with what the word is uh, li- how the word is lifting you come on go into those comments and say amen or hallelujah or praise god or hit those likes or hearts that i guess that's the new that's the new uh, applause or worship to god when we hear something that resonates with us we hit that like button or heart button if that's what we have to do then that's what we'll do so i want you to really engage today i want you to really connect with your church family i want you to make sure today that the day doesn't go by that you don't pick up the phone and call one of your uh church family friends and and just talk to them and connect with them and say hey and I miss you and I love you and uh, we're praying for you whatever you want to do but let's continue to make connections more important now than ever that we get intentional about connecting with one another now let's get into this message today I'm so excited this series has been so good for me as I have prepared it and studied on it and I'm excited to every week give you these messages and which way do we go from here? Right now, that's kind of how we all feel. It's this idea of getting directions when you don't know the final destination. And today, I'm going to talk to you about the idea of overcoming uncertainty. Wow, overcoming uncertainty. I think that we all need a little bit of that right now. So let's read our text together. Hey, do me a favor. Uh, just do me a favor real quick. Get up. You know, normally when we're when we're in church together, we stand in honor of the reading of the word. So today, would you do me that favor? Just grab your Bible, grab your notebook, whatever your version, and just stand up. Let's all do it together, all over, wherever you're watching from, whether it's locally right here in the Panhandle, right here in Canyon, or around the world. Come on, just get up, get your Bible, and let's read the text together. It'll go up on your screen. But let's just do this in honor of community and honor of reading God's word right now. We're going to read our text again, which is Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, and we're reading out of the Amplified Bible. And here's what it says, trust in and rely confidently on the Lord with all of your heart, and do not rely on your own insight or understanding. In all your ways, know and acknowledge and recognize Him. And he will make your path straight and smooth, removing obstacles that block your way. Father, take this word, put it down deep in our hearts, encourage us today, strengthen us today, give us wisdom today, give us insight today, and help us, Heavenly Father, to be filled with your spirit and equipped to do all the work of the ministry that you need us to do right now with our families, in our community, at our jobs. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said... Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining me for that. Man, God is so good. I love that passage of scripture. And as we've gone through that a little bit and broken it down uh, the last couple of weeks, I tell you, it is so important. And I think that's one of the things that God is teaching us right now. Uh, We were on a prayer time not long ago and my son-in-law, our creative pastor here at Summit Church, he said something very important. He said, I just hope we have our pencil and paper out. And I really appreciated his comment because what he was saying is there obviously there's something going on bigger than what we can see. And yes, there's a virus. Yes, there's a pandemic. Yes, we're all trying to deal with all of that. But behind the scenes, what's happening is not what's really happening. Behind the scenes, there's something God is doing. And he was just saying, in my own personal life, I'm growing, I'm developing, and I just hope we all have our pencil and paper. I hope we're taking notes. And I think one of the most significant things that God is teaching us right now is to trust him. 
One of the things that I've always been very impressed about when I travel the world uh, and especially go to developing nations is this uncanny simplicity that they have in their life. You know, and there's the, the, the simplicity they have in their life is in large part because they don't have a lot. They don't have a lot of the distractions we have. They don't have a lot of the possessions that we have. And some of us may look at that and say, oh, that's horrible. And in some cases, it is literally horrible. But the truth is, as you look at their culture, it's a lot more simple and it's definitely unencumbered. And uh, Christians in those cultures, because they have to, but also because they want to, they, they have learned to daily trust God. I mean, what does it mean to trust? Let's be honest. What does it mean to trust God? What does it, what does it mean? It, does it mean to just give him mental assent? Does it mean to just acknowledge that I'm going to do a little devotional? I'm going to have a little time in the word. I'm going to say a little prayer. Does it mean uh, that we are saved, that we've come to the knowledge of Christ and we've given our life to him? You know, because here at Summit, that's what we do, right? Uh, we, we lead people to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, make a difference. Is that what it is? is? Is that the fullness of it? Or does trusting God daily mean something else? Is it a little deeper? Does it go a little further than what we have experienced or what we have engaged in in our life? And I think today what's happening because of the mystery of all this, because of the uncertainty of all this, because of we don't know when and what and where and how. And, 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 and for us, we were talking to some health officials this week, and the thing that, that one of them said to me, and I, an unbelievably impressive young lady, just amazing woman, uh, doing a great job, by the way. And she, she said, what confuses us and what makes us so anxious here in America and really the Western world is usually when something happens to us, we are Johnny on the spot. We are ready with whatever medicines we need, with whatever process we need. And this has, is so new. It's novel. It's new. It, it's not ever experienced it before. We don't know how to handle it. We're learning as we go. And, be, and with that uncertainty has come anxiety. And so I think what God is teaching us, church, come on, listen to me. I think what God is teaching us, if we'd stop, get our pencil out, get our paper out, and just listen to the voice of God, he's saying to us, learn to trust me. You, you can't trust your economy. I've talked to a lot of people this last week that are just afraid because of the economy. They're watching too many negative things. It's important. Yes, and, it, and, 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 it, and it, it will affect us if it has negative circumstances, but if we'll keep in obedience to God and we learn to trust him, the Bible, David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. So, so God is our provider. And when we learn to trust him every day, see, here's the problem. Here's the problem, y'all. Come on, stay with me. Here's the problem. We are a bunch of control freaks. We want to be in control of every circumstance, of every situation, of everything that goes on. Even when there's a negative, we want to be able to know how to handle that and handle it right now and get it done. Take care of it. Come on. Isn't that, isn't that us? We, we just, uncertainty is not a part of the bargain. We don't want to ever be uncertain. We don't want to ever walk through something we can't control. We want to just handle it and move on. Because by the way, we're West Texas people and we can pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and we can take on anything and we can pioneer. And, 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 and that is really true. And, and this is a really great place, place and I love it that way. I mean, I can't even, there are some days I can't even find anybody to help because every time I ask somebody, hey, what can I do for you? They say, oh, I'm doing great. What can I do for you? <laughs> That's just how West Texas people are. I love you guys. Oh, I love this place. I, this is our home, but we do have an issue, and the issue is we've learned, we've learned to trust ourselves more than we trust God. Let's just be honest about it, okay? Let's just be honest about it. In a lot of ways, we've learned to trust ourselves more than we trust God. And we learn to control situations, and we have resources, and we know how to get things done. And so we, in a lot of ways, have said, hey, God, we love you. We want you to be a part of our life. But I got this. This is okay. And what's happening in this setting is God's bringing us back to a place, church, where we're learning to trust him again. Because the bottom line is ourselves 
our resources, our system of government, our, our, our community can only do so much. And at certain points, we're limited. But we serve a limitless God. Let's think about that for a minute. We have limits. He has no limits. We have stopping points. He has no stopping points. We have issues that are just too big for us to handle, not for him. And even if the worst case scenario in our mind happened where we were no longer alive on this planet as believers, that is not the end. It's only the beginning. And we go into eternity, into the presence of God. He is limitless. Although he created all things that exist and all things that exist consist in him, he is not limited by them. He stands outside of them. Come on. This is who you serve. You can trust him. Have you ever been lost? Have you ever been beside yourself in a situation where you had no control and you were completely uncertain? You, you, you absolutely had no idea how things were going to turn out. I was uh, with my grandfather one time and uh, he had some errands to do and uh, they lived in a different town than us. They lived in Norman, Oklahoma. And we lived, I think, at that time in Muskogee, Oklahoma. And I was around 10 years old, and I was visiting them and staying with them for a few days. And uh, my grandpa said, I want to go run some errands. And he had several things to do. And at that time, I was just learning how to play the drums. And I knew at his church he had a set of drums. So I said, hey, Grandpa, while you're doing all these errands, that's going to be kind of boring for me. I don't want to sit in the post office. So can I just go up to the church and play drums? And when you get done, you can come and get me. That sounds like a great idea because I, you know, I feel like he probably didn't want to have to drag me around everywhere <laughs> anyway. So he took me up to the church and here's what he said. He said, David, here's the deal. I'm going to lock all the doors. This side door right here, it locks from the inside. There's not even a way to get back in. There's no, it, it closes. There's no handle. There's nothing. So if you go outside and this door closes, you can't get back in. So if you get tired of being in here and you go out, you just need to understand you're going to have to sit here and wait. And so... I really don't know how long he was gone, but I know when he left, it was daylight outside and uh, it got dark. And so I had played the drums till my hands were tired and I didn't want to play anymore. I'd messed around in the church and did, tried to keep myself busy. And then I just decided, well, he's probably about to come because it's getting dark outside and he's probably finished with his errands and he's going to come pick me up. We're going to go back to the house and eat. And so I thought that this, this is going to be awesome. So I, what did I do? I, I stepped out that door. I turned all the lights off. I stepped out that door and it closed behind me. And when it closed behind me, I had this sensation of, uh-oh, uh, I can't get back in. And it was getting chilly outside. I was in a short sleeve shirt. I was 10 years old. It was getting dark. And I just sat down and I thought, I'm going to wait. And he didn't come and he didn't come. Now, you have to remember, you have to remember, uh, no cell phones, no connection, no way of knowing where each other is at. And so in my mind, they lived miles and miles and miles away. But in my mind, which I have no sense of direction anyway, right? My mind, I said, I can, I'll just walk home. He's, he's really late. I'll just walk home. And, and, and I don't know why it didn't dawn on me that if I start walking and he shows up, he's not going to know where I'm at. He's not going to be able to get a hold of me. My grandmother doesn't know where I'm at. She's at home. And what, what it goes on in a kid's mind, I don't get it. So I just took off, started walking. And I mean, it got darker and darker and I'm walking and all of a sudden now I'm starting to get scared because I'm realizing I have no clue where their house is. I have no clue where their addition is. I have no clue how to even get there or find it. And the more I walked, the further away I felt. I don't know if you've ever gone through being lost in any scenario, but I'm telling you, it is the oddest feeling. The more you go, the more uncertain you feel. And that's, that's what happened. And so I just, I, I began to cry. I began to fear. Uh, there was a, 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 I shouldn't say this this way, but back then there was a, a mental institution in Norman. And of course, as a 10 year old, uh, all your friends tell all these creepy stories. And I'm telling you, I'm walking by the, the gates and fence of that. And, and I'm, I'm having every scary thought you can think because my friends told me all oh, that there's bad people in there and who you don't ever want to get stuck. And it was just stupid kids being stupid. And I'm walking by that. I'm telling you, fear is all over me. I'm like, 
what's going to happen to me? I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm just walking and walking. And finally, I walk into this addition. It wasn't their addition, but it was a development. And I walked into it and, and I thought, maybe this is it. It doesn't look like it, but maybe this is it. And I'm, I'm walking street to street now, deeper and deeper into this addition. And there's a man standing out or set uh, underneath his car in his garage. His, the headlights on in his garage. And I just remember, I'm 10 years old. I should have known better than this. But I walked up, and he is underneath his car working on his car. And I'm just crying and scared and frightened. And I walk up, and I said, sir, <laughs> now think of the foolishness of this statement. I said, sir, sir, and he scooted out from underneath his car, and he looked up at me, and he was like so shocked to see a 10-year-old boy that he didn't know standing in his garage. And I said, sir, can you tell me how to get to my grandpa's house? <laughs> so this guy don't know my grandpa from Adam. I don't know the destination of where I'm going, but I'm asking him for directions. Do you feel a little bit like that right now? Do you feel a little bit like, man, I just need somebody to tell me where to go, what to do, how this is going to work out. But if they were to ask me, where is it you're wanting directions for, I couldn't tell them because I'm uncertain. And so that guy, you know what he did? He took me into the house and he, 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 he hollered at his wife, sweetest little lady. I, re I remember, I can see them clearly in my mind today sweetest little grandma in the house and she she said honey what's wrong and I said I, I'm lost I, I, I'm trying to explain the story and and she I mean before you could think about it she had milk and cookies sitting in front of me and they were just loving on me and they said well son what's your grandfather's name and and so so that I told them my, my grandfather's name and they said well hold on just a second and they went out and got this book I don't know if you've ever seen it it was a big thick yellow book and there was a lot of names in it <laughs> It's called a telephone book. And they looked up my grandfather's name and they found the address and then they called the house and of course got my grandmother. And my grandfather had gone by the church. I wasn't there. He had gone by grandma's. I wasn't there. He was scared out of his mind. His grandson was lost in Norman, Oklahoma. And grandmother was worried and I mean when she, when they called I got on that phone and she was bawling and oh David what where did you go we were so scared and we thought someone had taken you and it was a horrible situation but I never felt so much comfort and you know that's that's how the Holy Spirit is to us can I just can I just say something to you we need the Holy Spirit you know the Holy Spirit is like that little grandma that little grandpa that is at work, always at work. And we walk into an uncertain situation and we may not even have all the information. And we may not ha have know what to do. We not, may not know even where we're going. And we may feel completely uncertain and completely emotional and completely afraid of the situation. And what does the Holy Spirit do? He just... He sets the, those cookies and milk down and he says, hey, it's going to be all right. We're going to figure this out. And he walks us into our solution. <laughs> I'll never forget it. I walked out uh, to the car when my grandfather showed up and I was just so happy to see him. I didn't realize how much trouble I was in, y'all. And so I got in the truck and he was, he was so shook and he was teared up in his eyes and he says, oh, David, I'm so glad that we found you. I mean, he was crying. It was, it was a scary situation. And uh, he said, I'm so glad that we found you. I love you so much. And then he said something I'll never forget. And I'm just going to be honest. I don't understand why we as older people say such concrete things to children who do not think abstractly. They think concrete. So when you say things to them, they take it absolutely literal. And he said something to me. He said, son, I love you and I'm so glad uh, that I found you, but if you ever do this again, I'm going to skin you alive. <laughs> All I could think of when I've seen fish, the, you know, the skin pulled back on a catfish, or I'm thinking he's going to skin me alive. Why do we say things like that? But it was so scary for him. Uh, have you ever said things like that to your kids or your grandkids? Uh, my dad used to say something to me. He used to say, I'm going to knock a knot on your head so high you have to tiptoe to touch it. I don't think that's right, y'all. I don't think we should be saying stuff like that. 
Have you ever told your kids, I can't buy that. It'll cost an arm and a leg. Have you ever imagined what they might be thinking in their head when you say that? It's so funny how we do that. But you know, when we don't understand and we, we are afraid and we become uncertain, it can cause certain anxieties to rise up within our lives. And I know that all of us right now at times feel uncertain. In this moment, we just don't know. And I've been in meeting after meeting after meeting online and in, even in person this last week with different people who are at different levels of uncertainty, economic uncertainty, physical uncertainty, knowledge uncertainty, just what's going on, why is this happening, why doesn't God just stop this, and we're going to be praying that he does. But here's what I know, we're going to take full advantage of this moment to learn everything we can learn and to receive everything we can receive from God as we go through this. I learned a lot of things on that little trip. I learned you don't ever, ever, ever uh, uh, leave when you're supposed to stay. I learned that you, 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 if you don't have a way to communicate with the people who you're connected to, that you can get lost and fall between the cracks. I, I learned that when you are lost, the people who are responsible for you are just as concerned and afraid and uncertain as you are. I learned that I really, really, really appreciated my grandparents. You know, feeling lost is the worst feeling. It paralyzes you. It, it makes you feel anxious. It makes you feel powerless. You're at the mercy of your circumstances. And this is how it feels right now. I mean, I mean, it feels like we've lost control of our own lives. It feels like life is acting on us. We're not acting on it. It feels like we're no longer in the driver's seat. And that's great. That's exactly where we need to be. We need to literally get out of the driver's seat of our own life, let God sit in that seat, and literally trust him to take us where we need to go. Brandon A. Trine says this, it is how we embrace the uncertainty in our lives that leads us to the great transformations of our souls. You know, questions start filling our minds when we're uncertain. Questions like, where do we go from here? Or how do we get back to normal? What is normal? Will things ever be the same again? Will our kids have to live in fear in the future? Will this be over anytime soon? Will it ever be over? Uncertainty consumes us because the truth is, no matter what we want to be true, we don't know the answers to these questions. And I'm just going to submit to you today that in life in general, even when you're not in a crisis like this, we don't know the answers to these questions. This is why we need God. This is why, believers, we need to trust him. Come on, turn to your neighbor, to whoever you're sitting with, or if you're just by yourself today, look in a mirror or just say to yourself, trust God. You know, we all face these situations, and I want to speak real quickly to just people who are already in this situation before this crisis happened. You know, some of you, before this all took off and we started sheltering in place and we had this virus that's so transmissible and it's all over the world and all of this, you were already dealing with something. Uncertainty had already attached itself to your life. Maybe it's a family issue or a financial issue or a health issue or, you know, I want you to know that you probably right now feel piled on. But listen to me, God is... He sees. He sees you where you are. He has not left you. He is walking with you. You need to reach out to him in faith and reach out to your church family and let us be a comfort and a help to you in this time. You know, David, even King David, the great King David, the giant slayer, the giant killer, he had moments in his life where it was complete uncertainty. I want to read a passage of scripture to you and, and read along with me in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1 through 19. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. 
They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, burned with fire. And their wives, their sons, their daughters had all been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But, everybody say that, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. So David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him. He answered him. Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. Listen to me. There's nothing we don't go through that God's not paying attention. And there's nothing that we go through that God can't change or can't fix or can't restore or can't heal or can't deliver. And so that's where our faith needs to be. We don't need to fear and put our focus on things that are uh, 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 scary for us and things that are uncertain and, 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 and get in this place of discomfort because we can't control things. No, no, no. We need to stop trying to control it, embrace the uncertainty and just say, God, I know this is a part of life, but here's what I I know. And I know that no matter what the crisis is, your hand is on me. I know it doesn't matter what the uncertainty is. I can trust you because the whole world, you realize that Jesus even said this and the apostles even said this, that this world will pass away, but my words will not pass away. He said, I will create a new heaven and a new earth at some point in our future history. That will happen in, in, in the scheme of things, the overall scheme of things. But he said, all of that will go away, but I will not go away. My word will not go away. And the man who obeys my word will not go away. Listen, everything else will be destroyed. But if we're standing in faith, if we are abiding in him and he is abiding in us, the Bible says we can ask what we will and it shall be done for us. Come on. Don't give up. Don't get disconnected. Don't fail to stay in trust, in faith with God. They were just living their lives. David was actually helping another nation. He had, because Saul was chasing him and Saul was after him. And he had brought all these people to him that were oppressed by King Saul. And they had come to David for relief. And David made a great big army and family out of them. And they were called David and his mighty men. And he literally was effective. And he had joined with another nation and he was helping them. And, and, and they had said, we don't want your help right now. And so they were just going back to their home at Ziglag. And when they got there, the Amalekites had burned their home down and taken all of their family, all of their wealth, all of their goods, all of their children. And so here they come back, these warriors, they're tired, they're worn out. They've been traveling for a few days. They show up and everything's gone. Listen, that's a crisis. Everything is gone. And they just fall apart. They just live in their lives. And out of nowhere comes an attack. It made them feel so completely off balance. These were mighty men. These were men who, who fought in battles where one man killed 700 men by himself. Listen, these were men that stood in fields that the Philistines or the Midianites would attack. And they would stand there and fight for their harvest by themselves, no one else there. And a regiment of 75, 100, 150 military men would come down to take their field from them and they would stand in their field and fight them off. These were men of courage, men of strength. They were men who, who had dedicated their loyalty to David. They had committed their life to follow him because he was such a great leader and such an influential man. But this put them so off balance because it was such a strike against their core. It made them feel so uncertain. If this can happen, what can't happen? They got so angry that some of them even started talking about killing David. You know, it's funny how you're with the leader in your life and you're with the boss in your life and you're with the, the wife and husband in your life and you're with the people that are in authority in your life and then all of a sudden when things go bad, they're the enemy. It's interesting how human nature can do that. We need to understand just because we feel devastated, just because we see the externals of what's going on, doesn't mean that that's what's really happening. 
Remember, everything you see externally is temporal, but God deals in the eternal. And so we can understand that God is up to something. So here were David's options. David's options were he could give up. He could get into conflict with those around him. He could become frustrated at God. He could be overwhelmed by his circumstances. That's the choices he had. I'm sitting here. Uh, he was in a heap on the ground in the middle of the ash that had been left of his home. He realized that his wife, his family, his kids, his possessions had all been taken. He didn't know if they were alive or dead. And not only that, but all the people he was responsible for, they had the same experience that he did. He sat down, he knelt before God, and he was in a moment where he had to make a choice. Am I going to give up? Am I going to get in conflict with those around me? Am I going to become frustrated at God? Am I going to be overwhelmed by these circumstances? So instead of doing any of that, we read what happened. And so there were three things, and I'm giving you those three things real quickly, and then we're going to close. Three action steps to overcome the feelings, the issues, the problems with uncertainty. The first thing David did is he strengthened himself in the Lord. Now, I want you to think about what that says. In some translations, it says it this way. He encouraged himself in the Lord. You know, sometimes when life knocks us down, we just stay down. Sometimes we've been hit so many times and it, it, life has piled on so much that we just like, I'm just going to stay down here on the mat and I hope somebody comes and picks me up. And we let discouragement set in on us. We let a pity party come into us. We let depression settle in on us. And then we think, well, we just need help. We need somebody else to tell us what we need to do. We need, you know, sometimes, sometimes when you're in a situation, you just have to Dig in and encourage yourself in the Lord. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. Here's what he did. He took personal responsibility for his situation. He decided and determined, I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. He didn't. Now watch this. He didn't look for somebody to blame. The other people around him were looking for somebody to blame. They were going to blame him. He didn't look for somebody to blame. He, he, he didn't try to say, well, if those uh, Philistines that we were working with, that, that, that group of Philistines that we were helping, if they hadn't turned us away, we wouldn't be in this situation. So after I figure this out, I'm going to go get them. No, he didn't blame anybody. And sometimes as humans, when we get into difficult circumstances, we start wanting to blame shift. Well, if the government would do this differently or if, if people would handle this differently and we start getting angry and bitter and, and we start saying things we shouldn't say and we start doing things we shouldn't do because we're mad and we want somebody to pay for this. And the truth is none of those things are our source and can do anything about it anyway. So what we need to do is instead of getting angry and frustrated and blame shifting, we just need to go to God. I remember in that situation, I was blaming my grandfather. Why didn't he show up? Why did he take so long? Why did he let it get dark? Why am I out here? It's my grandfather's fault. And he was blaming me. That kid, if that kid would have just been here, if he'd have done what I told him to do. But all of that blaming didn't change the situation at all and didn't help anyone. He didn't look for someone to blame. Don't take time out to complain. David didn't stop and go, this is horrible. Why are we going through this? Why is this happening? And there's nothing wrong with asking why, but don't stay in the why bubble. Get out and start worshiping God and trusting God. Here's what you need to do. Become your own cheerleader. I'm just going to be honest. We have a church family and we're here for you and you're here for us and and we've got a great community and there's always people wanting to help, but there are some times in life where there's nobody there. And it's just you and nobody else understands and nobody else gets it. And it's just you. And you're going to have to have the gumption and the faith and the trust in God to strengthen yourself in the Lord. <laughs> Listen, some of y'all need to go into your bathroom today. And before you get around your family anymore, you need to have an attitude check. You need to look in that mirror and you need to start telling yourself, God has got 
this. I am an overcomer by the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony. I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ who loved me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God made me unique and wonderful and he's got purpose for me and destiny for me and nothing has changed that and nothing can change that and I'm going to take this on because I'm not trusting in myself. I'm not trusting in other people. I'm not trusting in finances. I'm not trusting in possessions. I'm trusting in my father God who loves me and cares for me and I'm taking those cares and those anxieties I'm placing on him and listen you look in that mirror and you say to yourself you listen to me you be strong in the Lord you get up and you move forward into what God has for you come on somebody that's what we got to have this week that's what we got to have right now today that's what we need in strengthen himself encourage himself in the Lord stop waiting for somebody else to do for you what only you can do. Stop waiting for somebody else to do for you what only Jesus can do for you. Amen. The second thing David did, so important, he inquired of the Lord. In other words, he prayed. This week, we're going to be praying every morning. I'm gathering the team on a Zoom, and we go on Facebook Live on your Summit Church. I want every single one of you to join me. It'll be around 7.30 in the morning, 7.20 to 7.30, and I want you to join me. And I'm going to ask this week that we not only pray together, but I'm going to ask us to fast. You know, I hear a lot of people saying, I want this to change. Why doesn't this stop? You know, the Bible tells in 2 Chronicles, if my people, in verse, uh, chapter 7, if my people, I think verse 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways and, and, and I will forgive their sins, I will heal their land. And, I, I, and, and there are some things, there are some things that nothing else can fix except prayer and fasting. And this week, we're going to pray and we're going to fast. Now, I'm not telling you what to fast. I'm going to fast, uh, I'm going to fast some food. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, do some, some part of it will be a total fast and just drinking liquids. Some part of it will be probably a Daniel fast, but I'm fasting and praying before the Lord this week. And it's not going to be easy. Got a lot to do, but I'm doing it. Why? Because I want to get in that place with God where I'm totally surrendered to him. I want to disconnect from the worries and the temptations and the trials and the issues of this world and the flesh and carnality, and I want to reconnect in a massive way to my Father and his Holy Spirit through Jesus, his Son. Listen, that's what we need to do. So this week, I want you to be watching for that. We're going to fast and we're going to pray, and we are going to see breakthrough. You hear me? We're going to see breakthrough because that's how it comes. How long are we going to sit and go, man, I wish this would stop, and instead go, Father, we want you to move. Father, we need revival. Father, we need a spiritual renewal like we've never seen before. Father, we need this virus to cease and desist. Father, we need the transmissibility of this to stop. God, we need everyone who has it to be healed and everyone who's in transition with it, that it goes out of their body. Father, in Jesus' name, the fear that came with it, the anxiety that came with it, we're calling it done. We are rebuking it in the name of Jesus and we're walking this out. Come on, somebody. That's where we're going to be. So we're going to fast and we're going to pray but David inquired of the Lord he asked God so much of the time when we get into situations where we're uncertain the reason we can't overcome that uncertainty is because we don't ask God we just talk about it we talk about it to ourselves we talk about it to our family we talk about it to our friends we talk about it to our counselors we talk about it to our career our people at, on our job we talk about it in 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 uh, to our friends across the fence we just man we just talk about it to everybody but somehow some way we have forgotten that we can trust God and the first person we should go to with every uncertainty and every issue and every circumstance is our Father 
God, come on, y'all. Our Father Jehovah God, who is our provider, who is our healer, who is our deliverer, who is our Savior, who is our Lord, who is our King, who is our everything, our banner that goes before us, the fire that protects us from the dangers in the night and the cloud that goes before us by day, His redemption, His redemptive power and presence hide us in the secret place of His grace and we cannot be hindered or harmed. His name is a tower that we can run into to and be safe come on somebody let's again believe let's again understand who we need to be talking to is our father who knows everything about us who understands this circumstance more than we do who knows what's really going on and what really is happening he knows and he's using and he's touching and he's ministering and we need to inquire of him he asked god he prayed prayer is a necessity It's important to have a habit of prayer. Now, I'm going to speak to something real quick. Some of you may have not been in a habit of prayer coming up into this crisis. And you may be having these condemnation feelings. You may be having these feelings of, man, I haven't been a person of prayer. Now, I don't feel like I can go to God and ask him for something now and ask him for help. Because, man, you know, because that's what condemnation does to us. That's what fear does to us. That's what's wrong in religious thinking does to us. It makes us think things like that. But I can tell you right now, if I hadn't talked to my kid in a year, and they come running to me and said, Dad, I need this. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm getting involved right now. You don't, I, I, you, you, you've, been, you've been away from me for a year. I don't know what's been going on in your life, but you showed up. You're mine. You belong to me. I'm getting involved in your situation. Come on, somebody. That's our Father God. That's how he loves us. I love what Beth Moore said. She said, there are parts of our calling, works of the Holy Spirit, and defeats of the darkness that will come in no other way than through furious, fervent, faith-filled, unceasing prayer. Come on, it's time we went there. Listen to me. It's time we went there. No more, no more passive prayer. No more uh, religious prayer. We're getting down to business. We're talking to our dad. We're getting in his throne room. We're fervently, ferociously speaking, extending faith, and getting busy in prayer. It's not just that he asked, though. Listen, it's not just that he asked. It's what he asked. Sometimes when we pray, it reveals our heart. It reveals our motives. It reveals our attitude. Think about what David could have prayed. He he could have prayed an ambiguous prayer. Lord, what do we do? But there's no faith in that. It's just lazy prayer wanting God to line it all out uh, without us having to engage on any level. He, He could have prayed a venting prayer. I have a feeling that a lot of us, including myself, this is where we get lost, a venting prayer. Are we really even talking to God or are we just using what we're calling prayer time, a time to throw up our complaints on God? And what venting prayer is, fearfully complaining about how mistreated we feel. And, and, And even though this is what David could have done, he said, I was helping somebody. I was doing something good. But look what's happened to us. Why is this happening? That's a venting prayer. And I'm not saying God can't handle that or that there are not times that you feel like you have to do that. But I'm saying that's not a valuable prayer. A valuable prayer is is a different kind of prayer. We'll talk about it in a moment. He could have prayed a blaming prayer, blaming the Amalekites. He could have said, if it hadn't been for them, this wouldn't have happened. If I hadn't been helping the Philistines, this wouldn't have happened. He could have even blamed God. Why did you let this happen? I know we all feel like that sometimes. But we need to take a step back and watch what David did. He inquired of the Lord, but it wasn't just that he asked, it's what he asked. Instead, he prayed an intentional, forward-thinking prayer. It was filled with faith. It was filled with hope. It was filled with solution. Here's what he prayed. Very simple one sentence. Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? See, David wasn't thinking backwards. He was thinking forwards. What are we thinking right now? Listen to me in this last couple of minutes. What are we thinking right now? Are we thinking backwards? Are we thinking present? Are we thinking forward? 
Are we worried about forward? Are we anxious about forward? Or are we praying faith, in faith about forward? Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake? They were exhausted. They'd just been traveling for two days. 200 men of the 600 he had with him couldn't even go. They were so exhausted. He said, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I take it? What are you asking God in this situation? What are you crying out to God in this situation? Are you just praying, God, help me? Are you just venting the problem? Are you just saying, God, why is this happening? Are you just blaming? Or are you saying, God, I believe there's something to this. I believe if the whole world is being affected by this, I believe there's something to it. And I believe that you're behind the scenes working in the church and working in believers. And God, I don't want to miss that. So here's what I'm asking, God. What do we do next? Which way do we go from here? I'm not asking for the full definition. I'm not uh, the definition. I'm not asking for the destination. I don't know what's at the end of the staircase. I'm just saying, God, what are the next steps that I take? How do I lead my family? How do I continue to connect with my church? How do I move forward in reaching out to others? How do I make sure that my finances are where they need to be? God, what do you need me to do? What do you want me to do? How do I move forward? Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? What is your attitude in this? What is your heart in this? Are you going to let it overwhelm you? Or are you going to throw the encumbrances of fear and doubt and uncertainty on your life? Are you going to throw them off and say, no, you have no part with me. My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And, and we know that that was a reference to Isaiah 53, that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The necessity that we have peace was laid upon him. And with his stripes, we're here. That's the God we serve. Nothing is impossible with him. Listen to me. Nothing is impossible with him. Nothing. What are you praying? He had a plan. He just needed to know that God was on it. He didn't want a good plan. He wanted a God plan. Shall I go? Shall I overtake? He needed to know that God had his back. He asked God what he should do. And listen to me, he was willing to do it. Sometimes we ask God what we should do. But we're not necessarily willing to do it when he tells us. You know, when Joshua says, God, how are we going to defeat Jericho? He says, walk around the walls. I bet there was a moment where Joshua said, what? What? <laughs> come on when God when Gideon said God what are we going to do he said get up blow some trumpets drop some pitchers and it's only going to be 300 of y'all against thousands upon thousands the what see sometimes we ask God what to do he tells us and we go what no 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 it, it, it's David's willingness to not only ask but to do listen this is the type of prayer you pray when you're going through something. God doesn't just want to give answers for you to get provision to you, but God wants to bring blessing to you and get it through you. And the third thing David did, and the last thing, and I close with this, he obeyed the instructions of the Lord. So he, he encouraged himself in the Lord, one. He inquired of the Lord, Two, and he obeyed the instructions of the Lord. Three, God has an answer. God has a solution. God will direct and guide us to that solution. If we turn to him and not others, and if we are willing to do what he asks us to do, he will come through every time. James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25, read it with me. It says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So here's what I'm leaving you with today. You can overcome the uncertainty of this situation. You can get away from fear and anxiety. You can trust that this is going to turn out okay. God is on our side. He is going to walk us through. But here's what you need to do. You need to ask, you need to believe, and you need to be willing to act. 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. We ask you to help us to overcome the uncertainty by trusting, relying, and adhering to you. God, we attach ourselves to you. We attach ourselves to your word. We attach ourselves to your grace. And we just want to be closer to you than we've ever been. God, we want your will to be done in our lives. It has become important again to us, God. We no longer set you to the side. No more. We no longer trust in ourselves and our own resources. But God, we place our trust squarely and firmly on you. And we're asking you and we're believing you. What are the steps, the next steps we need to take? Is it leading our family in faith? Is it obeying you in some outreach? Is it is it ministering to some neighbor? Is it just praying and interceding and fasting? What is it, God? What would you have us do? And 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 here's what we know. It's what you told David. Yes. Oh, pursue them and overtake. Father, we just declare that that's the mentality that comes over us, that we will ask, we'll have faith, we'll be willing to act, and we just declare what David, what you told David, and I'm declaring this prophetically for you right now, church. When he said to God, when he prayed to God, and he said, shall I pursue, shall I overtake? And I'm declaring this to you right now. I sense the Holy Spirit. I don't care what people think. I feel like this is a prophetic word to you if you're listening to me, watching me right now. God spoke back to David because of his faith, because of his courage, because of his willingness to obey God. And here's what he said. He said, you shall pursue, you shall overtake, and you shall recover all and I'm saying to you you're not going to lose in this you're going to come out okay God has got your back just keep your trust in him in Jesus name Father we bless you we love you we give you glory in Jesus name amen amen so I just have one question before we go do you love him do you know him most of all do you know Jesus if you're watching this today, maybe you've never gone to church. Maybe you just said, hey, all this church online, I'm going to try it. Maybe somebody invited you. Maybe you've been in church all your life, but you don't have a relationship with God. Maybe you've been in relationship with God, but you know right now, man, things aren't right. And all of this has kind of put you on check. I just believe that now is your moment, and God could change your life starting right now. And so I want to ask you, if you want to make a commitment to God, I'm just going to pray. I'm, I'm assuming that there are people who, who want to do this. I, I know that there are. And I'm going to pray a prayer with you. And then after this worship experience is over, I'm going to ask you to go to the comments or the direct message and send a message to us that say, I have decided. And then give us your contact information on the card we ask you to fill out so that we can send you the resources that can help you along your spiritual journey. And we have a gift we'd like to give you. But if you know today that you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, or you know today that you need to rededicate your life to God, I want to pray with you. Listen, this world is an uncertain place, and it doesn't matter if there's a crisis going on or not. Life is uncertain. You do not have control over it. But we know the one who does. And he loves you with all of his heart. And so today, if you want that love in your life, if you want that change in your life, if you're willing to say, I repent, I turn from my wickedness and I turn to God and his ways. And I confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And I believe that he died on the cross for my sins. And I believe he rose again from the dead. And I commit to follow. If that's you today, I want you to make this decision. I want everybody to pray with us in your home right now, whether you need to make this decision or not. I know we're not in the room. I know that no one else can hear you. But listen, there might be somebody in your family right now that's making this decision and you don't know it. I want you to pray this prayer with me just in support of them. Everyone pray it after me and mean it in your heart if you need this prayer. And God's going to meet you where you're at and then we're going to help you along your journey. So say this after me. Father God, I come to you now in the name of your precious son, Jesus. I ask you to forgive my sins. I turn from my wickedness, from my way of doing things, and I turn towards you 
and your righteousness. I confess you are my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I confess and believe that you took my place on that cross so I could be forgiven. I confess and believe that death could not hold you and three days later you rose again from the dead. And I commit that from this day forward I'll follow you. In Jesus' name, I accept your grace, I accept your righteousness, I accept your love. Amen. Amen. Oh, praise God. I guess get stirred up because I know people are making decisions and I know people are rededicating their life and I know people are making decisions for the first time and I know many of us are rekindling that relationship with God like we never have before. Come on, let's go all the way with this. Why not? Why not just be completely radical for the kingdom of God and let God do whatever he wants to do as Lord and Savior of our life. Thank you so much for those of you who made a decision and make sure you give us that information because we, we will not bother you, but we want to help you. We want to connect you to a small group virtually. We want to connect you to materials and give you, send you a gift, uh, a, a book that we have that we have just for you and it's going to help you along what you need to do next and how your life uh, needs to be affected. And I don't know how we're going to do this. We haven't decided yet or determined it yet. But those of you who make decisions, you let us know. And we're going to find a way for water baptism. And um, I don't know exactly how that's going to look. I'm sure it's going to have some virtual component. But we're going to let everybody see that you made a decision. Your life has changed. Come on, somebody. I mean, I think that's awesome. We ain't going to let nothing stop us. Come on. Come on. So, um, so thank you. God bless you for that, man. Thank you. And if you live with the person who's made that decision, come on, lift them up, encourage them, help them, give them hope. I want to also encourage you to continue to give. Thank you so much for the generosity that you've shown and the obedience to God you've shown in the area of your finances as a church. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, God is going to reward you for your faithfulness, and he probably already is. I want to say thank you to you for being a part of everything we're doing and every initiative and every outreach and everything that we're trying to do. You are making it happen. Church, I love you, and I thank you for your heart. And I just want to encourage you, and remember, you can see on the screen right now how to give in the, the different ways. It's safe, it's secure, it's simple, and uh, we, we, you, you can know that the finance, the financial seed that you're sowing into the kingdom of God here is good seed going into good soil, and it's making a difference right here, right now. So I just want to say this scripture to you. It's, it's, it's the next verses out of Proverbs chapter 3. And it says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your crops. And to us, that would be income. Then your barns will be abundantly filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. Here's how it reads in the Message Bible. Honor God with everything you own. Give him the first and the best. Your barns will burst. Your wine vats will brim over. Here's what I want you to notice about those passages of Scripture. There are no conditions. The only condition is that you obey God and he'll take care of the rest. There are no conditions that say, if the economy is good, I'll provide for you. There are no conditions that say, if everything is working just right and there's no circumstances going on around your life, I'll provide. No, he just says, you obey me, I'll take care of it. And I just want to encourage you to do that. Bring our first and best. It's a way of honoring God and it's saying to God, you're first. Why would he have us do that first and best? Why would he do the tithe? Because it, it's, not, it's not for him. It doesn't change anything with him. It's for us. For us to continually remind ourselves he is first. He, he, he has given me stewardship over everything I have. And all he's asking me for is that first tenth. And I'm giving it to him. And then if you feel like you want to give over and above that, listen, talk to the Holy Spirit, pray. And whatever the Holy Spirit leads you to do, you just let us know and we will take that. Give your tithe. And if you want to do, and here's what we know. Every vision we have, every outreach we do, every need we're, need we're trying to meet, it will be met if we all will just obey the Holy Spirit. Amen. So thank you so much for being a part of our worship experience today. I want to bless you. Before we go through the rest of our week, would you stand with me and just hold out your hands like this? And just, I want to just speak a priestly blessing over you. As your pastor, I want your life to be blessed. I want your home to be blessed. I want you to be protected and provided for. I want spiritual, great, uh, relational, and, and revolutionary spiritual things to happen in your family. 
So let me pray this and bless this over you. If you just hold your hands out like this, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord t turn his face toward you and give you peace. May God bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound unto every good work. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being a part of our worship experience today. We love you. Have a great week. Join us for prayer and fasting this week. God's going to do something big. The best is yet to come.